Our next speaker has certainly stirred up the medical world. He has discovered an electric circulatory system. Dr. Bjorn Nordenstrom comes to us from Stockholm, Sweden, where he is professor of radiology at the Karolinska Institute. In 1985, he served as chairman of Karolinska's, I'm sorry, Karolinska's Nobel Assembly, which chooses the Nobel laureates in medicine. And most recently, he shocked the world with a discovery that you can read all about in Discover Magazine, April 86, or listen to Dr. Bjorn Nordenstrom this afternoon. I give you Dr. Bjorn Nordenstrom. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee of this conference for their kindness to invite me to participate. I feel very honored indeed. My topic today will be electrochemical treatment of cancer. <clears throat> now, in order to understand why, how, and when we can do that, I need to touch upon a little bit the system which was announced now, the system which is a mass transport system in tissue of electric origin. Tomorrow morning, 8.30, I will go into details and speak specifically about the vascular interstitial closed electric circuit, how it's energized and how it's channelized and what it may mean for our understanding of transport phenomena in tissue between blood and interstitial tissue fluid. So today I will only very briefly outline this system. And if you turn off the lights and give me the first two pair of slides, please. <clears throat> we all know that if we injure ourselves, cut ourselves, get an injury for chemicals, or burn, etc., this injury will deliver energy. It's called catabolic liberation of energy, which can be measured as an electric potential difference between the injured tissue and the surrounding tissue. This is a concept that is well known in many, many years in electrophysiology and the injury potential. For instance, if we introduce an electrode, you produce an injury which disturbs the measurements. Now, this disturbing component, this uh, injury potential, is in fact the important factor for energizing the vascular interstitial closed electric circuit, which is involved in the process of healing of tissue. We all know that tumors as cancers may develop necrosis in the center. This means an injury potential would develop. And in more than 100 cases, I measured the injury potential in tumors by introducing electrodes through the lung tissue and through the tumors and measure the rel relation to a reference tissue which was not injured in the surrounding tissue. means that we have a, a difference in charge of the tumor when it develops necrosis in relation to surrounding tissue which is not injured. And this system here mimics very much an ordinary flashlight battery. This gradient, electric gradient, is utilized in an ordinary flashlight battery to drive a closed circuit. To, know, to obtain that, we need to connect the terminals of the battery, short circuited over a lamp, and then the lamp in light, there is a flow through this unit. This is a closed electric circuit, powered by the occurrence of, or the presence of, of separation of ions, positive and, ne and negative. Now, in an injury, the tumor may be electronegative, as I've indicated here, in relation to surrounding tissue, which is then positive, or it may be electropositive. 
And this seems very curious because that doesn't happen in the flashlight battery. The reason is that due to the degradation of the injured tissue here, the potential will fluctuate in time and the pres presence of a fluctuating injury potential is extremely important for the process of healing because it can supply the tissue with both positive and negative ions during the process of healing. Well, we need here a closed circuit. Where is the closed circuit in vivo? I studied <coughs> systematically these possibilities and found that the vessels in the body, the arteries and the veins, have very high specific electric resistance in their walls. It's about 200, least, at least 200 times higher than the conducting medium of blood, which is the plasma. So, the vessels can be regarded as relatively insulated conducting cables. And this is an entirely new concept. Earlier we have all the thought about the blood vessels as passive channels for the supply of blood due to the pumping of the heart. But they can function as electrically insulated conducting cables. We connect the injured tissue with a non-injured tissue outside the injury to the level of the capillaries. But these are permeable for water and electrolytes and form a junction, electrical junction, between plasma and interstitial tissue fluid, which is equally conducting as the plasma. And this con corresponds to the internal communication in our flashlight battery. So we can really define all the necessary component in vivo of a circuitry which corresponds to this here. And this is a mass transport circuit. Now, there are many other details in the construction and activation here. I ca don't have time to go into here. This is something we will speak about tomorrow morning. But if you accept now the presence of this circuitry, powered by the injury potential, which leads to various processes in the healing process, as formation of scar tissue, accumulation of leukocytes, and many other things, you can think of why wouldn't it be possible to power this system artificially and to obtain new results. We could, of course, theoretically introduce an electrode here instead of waiting for an injury and place another one in the interstitial tissue fluid outside or in the vessel somewhere and connect them and lead current through the system. This idea I try to realize in an in vivo situation and to choose something that was reliable to study, I choose cancer. In order to try to enhance the heal healing of cancer, I applied electrodes in a way I will shortly describe to you. The reason why I chose cancer was, of course, that if you have a tumor malignancy, which is uh, histological or cytologically defined and, and, and proven, you know that this tumor will continue to grow if nothing is done to stop the growth. Therefore, it's a yes or no situation. Either I can heal a tumor or not. And this is, of course, a very tough condition, but it's healthy. It can, I can prove if I can do it or not. It would be much more difficult to try to heal, for instance, a fracture, because a fracture can spontaneously heal but the tumor malignancy very, very rarely can heal spontaneously. Next slide, please. Now, before we can do that, we need to have the diagnosis. <clears throat> I have earlier developed techniques for needle biopsies. This is one of these uh, instruments. It's an 0.8 millimeter thick needle, and it has in an indwelling little screw 
which is only 0.6 millimeter thick. This distance is 16 millimeters. And it's held by this instrument and introduced during fluoroscopy. As I'm a radiologist, I'm very well familiar with that technique, of course. When this needle is introduced to a tumor, I can touch the surface, I can see I touch the surface, and then I drive the little screw into the tissue. It sticks out like this. Then I rotate this little hub, which goes forward with a certain number of turns, and covers this screw, and I will have retained in the grooves of the screw the material for diagnosis. And that means all different cellular elements in the tumor will be sampled. In this way, it's possible to really confirm what we are dealing with, and that is a necessity, necessity in all scientific work. Next slide. <clears throat> now we can use the same instrument for implantation of electrodes, tiny electrodes like this. Here you can see a little Teflon-coated platinum electrode, which is introduced with its tip into the tip of the in BIOPS instrument. It's introduced, and then the cannula is retracted, and you can then, of course, if you want to, take a sample at the same time before you, you take out your instrument. So in one step, you can implant an electrode and get material for verification of your, of your tumor or the material you have. Several different kinds of tumors, uh, of, of electrodes are developed. Here's one with several. Uh, platinum strings and a channel here for gas to escape because there will be gas production at the electrode surfaces. Next slide. Here's another one with <coughs> large platinum rings which is also provided with a canal for removal of gas and for inf infusion of certain compounds which I will touch upon later on. There are also electrodes developed for intravascular use as this one. Next slide, please. Is it this mic? Thank you. As you can imagine, <coughs> there are many ways to implant electrodes, different routes. I have concentrated on lung tumors and breast tumors for the following reason. By using plain radiography, you can always determine the location and size of a tumor prior to treatment, and you can easily, with ordinary chest radiography, see the result. And the same can be said about breast cancers. <coughs> By means of mammography, you can determine the position of the tumor, the size, and if it regresses or not. I don't want to go into details here, but you can see here an electrode can be introduced through the chest wall, through the pulmonary artery, or, uh, for instance, here, um, both electrodes through the chest wall, etc. There are many, many possibilities to apply the electrodes, and it's difficult to say already, uh, say which you should technique you should use in the specific case, in every case. But usually, I use the supplying arterial vessels to combat primary tumor, and then I, ne I need to introduce into the, the aorta and another one into directly into the tumor. Now, this is an instrument we have developed for, we call the treatment processor. It gives us a possibility to keep, first to build up the voltage between the electrodes, slowly, because otherwise the patient will get a shock. The voltages I have been using, they vary between uh, 5 to 20 volts. And uh, when you have reached the appropriate level, you should keep it constant, very constant, not to produce any twitches or discomfort for the patient. Uh, the number of coulombs, which is the dose, is, is accumulated here, as seen here. And this is a time only, and here it shows the actual current which is flowing between the electrodes. There are certain safety uh, circuits, etc., and test circuits also in this um, uh, model, which uh, has worked very well for several years now. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> for the implantation of needles for biopsy and for implantation of electrodes, we need also X-ray equipment, and this is one I have developed and designed. It was built by Siemens Selema in Stockholm. It consists of two image intensifiers, and the correspond this is an intensifier, and this is an X-ray tube, and there's another intensifier and X-ray tube. These two arches can be uh, moved by servo motors in any direction, and even the patient can be lifted up with servo motors the table can be tilted and the patient can be automatically uh, rolled on, the, on this um, uh, support with servo motors. This flexible instrument has been very useful uh, in these invasive techniques I dis described. For the pre preliminary planning of the treatment and the insertion of electrodes, sometimes I may use of computerized tomography to determine where to place the anode, for instance, and the cathode, like this. Next slide. When working with the lung, it's always a danger to produce a leak of air into the, uh, the, into the pleura, which means a collapse of the lung, and the patient may feel discomfort from that. Therefore, I routinely introduce, in local anesthesia, a, a draining tube into the pleura and keep negative pressure so the lung is expanding, expanded all through the treatment. This can be made at the same time as prior to the implantation of electrodes, and it's not too discomfortable for the patient. All the treatments are made in local anesthesia after the patient gets the slight sedative, maybe. Um, after the introduction of the draining tube, and this is attached to a suction device that keeps the lung expanded. And then the electrodes are introduced also in X-ray fluoroscopy in two planes. And you can make it with very high precision. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what happens now when we introduce electrodes into a living subject, a human being or an animal? Here is a dog. I will show you something of what is going on. In this case, I have chosen to introduce a catheter into the left pulmonary artery. And I use here a metal electrode in the pulmonary artery as a cathode. The anode is implanted percutaneously into the lung tissue. And this is the side view, the lateral view, where you see the platinum electrode, which will be an made anodic electropositive, and this is electronegative cathodic. This can be of uh, stainless steel because it's an electron emitter and does not corrode, of course. Now, before treatment, I made an angiogram. You can see here that contrast medium is flowing uh, through the vessels here. But after the treatment, you can see here two things. In the area of the uh, an electropositive electrode. You have an effusion of contrast medium into the lung parenchyma. But here in the region of the electronegative electrodes, these large vessels are tapered and blocked. There is no flow out from these into the periphery in spite of their size. And this is due to what we call electroosmotic flow of water from the electropositive side to the electronegative side. And this water produces a compression of the vessel from outside and interferes with the circulation in this region, which is one of the effects which may uh, make the treatment possible. Now you wonder, perhaps, why do I do this? My primary thought was that if I place an electrode here and one there, make this electronegative, this electropositive, and let current flow between these, there will be an accumulation around the electropositive electrode of electronegative ions, while the electropositive will be expelled. And the opposite will happen around the electronegative, of course. And that means a tremendous distortion of the microenvironment in the fluid around the cells of the cancer. And cancer cells are very sensitive 
to changes in the microenvironment. And this is a traditional basis for all kinds of treatment of cancer today, except for surgery. If you use chemotherapy, hormones, heat, cold, whatever, radiation, they all serve to change the microenvironment. So in that sense, this is a traditional way of thinking, but it's a completely different new way because no one has tried to change the microenvironment in this way. And in fact, it works. If you continue now, look what happens with these dogs. Next slide. You will see, well, first, you will see the electrosmotic flow of water. This is a patient with a tumor, with a small electrode in the tumor, and one outside. After the treatment, you can see here an accumulation of water around the cathode. And this is actu actually an expression for the movement of water from the tumor area, which is dehydrated, to, the, to this cathodic area. Next slide. And this is better seen maybe in the dog I showed you. This is the area of the electropositive electrode, which is dry, dehydrated. And here you can see the area of the cathode, which is completely wet due to the fluid in the interstitial tissue, which compressed the vessels in this region. The black spot here is produced by reaction products from the electrode. Around the electropositive electrode, you have liberation of protons, H plus ions, which, as we say, migrate in the electric field. They move away from the positive electrode, and they destroy the tissue completely in the neighborhood. Because the pH here is down to 2, and no protein can survive or be uh, unchained in that surrounding. So this is here what we call acidic hematine, which forms the black spot of completely dead tissue. In the case a tumor had this size, it would be completely dis killed, destroyed, of course. The white spot in the middle is due to a bleaching of the black area due to chlorine, which bleaches the, the uh, already destroyed tissue. Now, the borderline here between the black zone and the normal zone is very sharp, which can be taken, or can be of advantage in certain cases. If you look at this part here, it's represented here in this slide by a completely destroyed part of the tissue here, and this is an intermediate zone, and this is normal tissue. And you can see this is a one millimeter. This is a knife sharp borderline between killed, completely destroyed tissue and normal tissue. And this is an effect that might be utilized in the, in the treatment of brain tumors in the future, where you want to keep the destruction limited to the tumor. There are many other things happening here in the lung which you don't see on this slide. Next slide. On the other hand, you can see here that we can measure the volume of the completely destroyed tissue. This is a very difficult tissue to treat, to destroy, that is muscle tissue. And this is completely destroyed as you see here. This litmus paper shows the red reaction due to the protons. This is, the, again, the chlorine bleaching in the center. And now we can here measure exactly the volume of destruction and correlate that to the dose of current which is mes measured in coulombs. And for each measurement or determination, it's specific for the amount of voltage you have applied. And this is made at the level of 10 coulomb, 10 volts. Why couldn't we then increase the voltage much more? Well, I can show you here what happens then. This is an animal, a dog, where one electrode is implanted in the left side of the chest. 
and another one in the right side of the chest, obliquely down here outside the liver. And after delivery of 200 coulombs at 40 volts, you can see here that the current has flown through the rib and destroyed it. It has flown through the diaphragm, completely destroyed this circular area, flown through the stomach, touched the liver, and went out on the other side. This is not the way to handle the things, of course. <laughs> it shows, however, the fantastic power of the method and also how dangerous it is if you use it in the wrong way. In this case, we have exceeded the tolerance of the conductive media of the living tissue. And the level will be somewhere around 20 volts. The standard voltage in the beginning was 10 volts. I tried the series in 20 volts. Now I'm going to 5 volts and I can get different kinds of reaction at the different voltages. Well, we will continue and see what happens. Next slide, please. Here I have plotted the amount of completely destroyed tissue, the black tissue in coulombs, in relation to the volume. And then you can have a rough idea how much you can completely destroy. And that is not a too dramatically large. 30 cc for 600 coulomb, that's not very much. But fortunately, we have other effects to rely upon. Before I tell you about that, I will show that the position of the electrodes means a lot too. This is a lung where you have a lobe between the middle lobe and upper lobe, the, the, the pleura. And if you place one electrode in the vascular bundle here, adjacent to this tumor, you can get a very nice field here and treat this tumor. However, if you use the same distance but place this on the other side of the pleura, like here, current has to flow first to the hyalus and then turn around and go back here because the pleura is a fibrous membrane with resistive properties. It blocks the current, so you must know something about the conducting properties of the tissues before you can correctly apply your electrodes and know what you will produce. On the other hand, I worked with 20 volts without any fear, close to the heart in the lungs in humans, because I know how I shape my field, where the current will flow. But if you try to lead current through the heart, well, you shouldn't try it because it's life dangerous also with a few millivolts. Next slide. <clears throat> I talked about field effects. It's not only the destructive effect, the black area, that we can rely upon. I showed you some compression of the cathodic vessels, but also the vessels around the anode will be chained there will, be there will be multiple microtrombosis around the tumor in the periphery, and they will influence on the circulation to the tumor from outside. And we cannot see that on plain radiographs, but in histology you can si find it. Another factor of importance is the massive white blood cells in the tissue around the anode. And this has led me to the formulation of a new theory for the accumulation of white blood cells in injured tissue. Today we talk about leukotaxis. This is a term that doesn't say anything about the mechanism. To me, the accumulation of leukocytes in injured tissue is an expression of the function of the vascular interstitial closed electric circuit which is powered, for instance, by an infectious local disease. Therefore, the leukocytes, which are negatively charged cells, they will be successively accumulated along around the anodic part of the circuitry. And that can be tested experimentally very easily. And you can see tomorrow how this can be used 
to indicate the changed pathways of transport when the vascular interstitial closed lactic circuit is switched on. This represents such um, accumulation of a venous branch in the mesentery of a dog. At the same time, I want to, you to pay attention to this vessel, which is an artery, uh, arterial capillary. These arterial capillaries are empty and contracted while the corresponding venous are wide and open. That's very interesting and important subject for tomorrow also. Next slide. Let us see now what happens when we treat patients. This is how we can implant an electrode in the small metastasis in the lung. And at the same time, I take out cellular material for verification of the diagnosis. And here you see in the lateral view the position of one electrode in the tumor, another outside. And in the beginning, I made the tumor electrode electropositive and the outside electrode electronegative. The reason was that tumor cells are negatively charged. And consequently, during application of current between them, I should tend to keep the malignant cells together during treatment. It could be dangerous, maybe, to place a cathode into the tumor because it could repel the tumor cells. Now, when you proceed and lead current between the electrodes, you can see gas formation around these small string electrodes. These tumors are, of course, very small. You see a rib is of that width. It's the width of a rib, one and a half to two centimeter tumor. Next slide. In this case, you may see a little tumor here. And I gave this tumor <coughs> altogether 90 coulombs at 10 volts. And the tumor nicely disappeared. It broke off a little tip of the electrode, which is here, it's completely innocent. And then the patient had also another tumor you may see faintly here as a light, uh, as a shadow behind the heart. And then I thought, as they were of about the same size, I should give the same, I gave twice the dose. Twice the dose, and here you can see it has only shrunken a little bit. While the other one, with the lower dose, disappeared completely. How does it come? The explanation for this is the following. With a larger dose, you get larger field effects and more microthrombosis in the periphery, which interrupt the possibilities of normal resorption of the dead material of the tumor. Therefore, you keep the, it stays here like a granuloma. But it's completely innocent, of course. It's not l less well treated as, as the other one, which disappeared. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a, one of the, my first cases. An old woman, she had two heart infarctions. You may see a little bulging contour on her left ventricle here. And two very small electrodes were introduced. This is a tumor and the tumor electrode. This is the peripheral electrode over there. And we will follow this case. And this is an ordinary radiograph before treatment. This is a metastasis from an ovarian carcinoma. Uh, she got this metastasis two years after the operation of her ovarian cancer. This is the situation here after the treatment, one month after. You can see here the starting development of fibrous tissue around the tumor, but also you have a reaction on the place of the electronegative electrode. Next slide. After seven months, you see how the tumor starts to diminish. Still you have such fibrous structures around. This is after one and a half year. This is after three years, and this is after Five years, the tumor is gone. A very small, slow regression of a tumor. And after five years, the patient died in the recurrency of her tumor in the pelvis. At autopsy, she didn't have any cancer in the lungs. 
But of course, that is pure luck. She could have developed more metastasis, but she didn't. Next slide. In the case she had developed more metastasis, I'm sure I would have attacked these two, these also. This is an interesting patient because it deals with a young girl, 19 years of age, and she had um, fibroliposarcoma of the uterus. An amputation was made of the uterus, but two years later she obtained four metastases, two in the right lung and two in the left lung. Surgeon, the surgeon, surgeons didn't want to operate, of course. She could have many more, of course. So she was put on chemotherapy. The largest tumor seen here is about four centimeters in diameter, at least. There was another one in the mid part of the right, of the right lung, which was three centimeters in diameter. In the left lung, she had two tumors, one and a half centimeter each in size. As she, these tumors continued to grow during chemotherapy and she lost her hair and was in bad condition, they stopped it and asked me to make an attempt to treat. And I treated all four tumors, this one two times, the other ones one time. And today, eight years, after the treatment, she's in good health and has no more tumors. I was lucky she didn't have more tumors. But of course, if new tumors should appear, I would immediately attack them. And the one thing is good, she has a lung left. In the case of metastasis, often it's so that the surgeon preferred to take a whole lobe, at least a large segment, in this case, you can keep the lung in place and you can make the treatment in local anesthesia. It takes you a couple of hours. You can talk to the patient during the treatment. Next slide. Here is a patient with a metastasis from a breast cancer. This is a lateral view. It's situated in the middle lobe. And it's a clear case for surgery. It's one single metastasis in the middle lobe. Very good indication for surgery. But the patient refused surgery in this case. She refused um, chemotherapy. And radiation treatment is inefficient in adenocarcinomas of this kind. So this, I got the opportunity to treat this tumor. Next slide. And this was five years after treatment. You see some scar tissue here. But she is now in good health eight years after the treatment too. And fortunately, she has no more metastasis. Next slide, please. <clears throat> it happens to be so that in many cases where you can see multiple tumors, you can see at each arrow here, there is a tumor infiltration. There's one even up here far out. And in this case, these tumors disappeared or reduced considerably in size, in spite of the fact that these were not located in contact with the electrode. These are field effects, which I talked about before. Deterioration of the circulation, accumulation of leukocytes, etc. There are many, many factors which we cannot over, uh, cannot determine the importance of yet. It has still to be explored. But this is a fact. Also small multiple tumors may be possible to treat efficiently in the future. Here I made a survey of <coughs> the first 26 malignancies which I treated, which are included in my book. So far, this material is included in my book. I have uh, outside the, the room here, you can have a look at. The STARS means regression. That means uh, either that the tumor completely disappear or they stop growing, diminish in size, and kept that situation for at least three years. And you can see here something interesting, that also this very small tumor progressed after treatment in spite of the fact that these tumors, which were larger, got, got the same dose. 
So this should disappear, of course, with the same dose uh, where these are larger. On the other hand, you can see also large tumors here, fairly large tumors, which have regressed to, to the treatment. So all tumors are not suitable for this treatment. But what can you expect? The patient material I've got is a selected poor material, which where surgery was given up, chemotherapy didn't work function, or radiation therapy didn't work. Next slide. I will show you some new, new interesting experiences now. This is represent a tumor, metastasis from a breast cancer in a woman from Finland. She was old and she couldn't stand surgery. After placing the anode in the tumor and the cathode outside, this tumor disappeared nicely within the course of nine or 11 months in this case. It's gone, as you see here. And this is now several years. Uh, she has no recurrency. And that is exactly what I suspected in the beginning, that the anode should be positioned in the tumor. But, next slide. Now you will see this case. A dramatic case where we have two large metastases from uh, a fibroliposarcoma of the uterus. Impossible to treat with radiation. Impossible to treat with chemotherapy. And surgery was not possible because she had another one, another tumor in the right lung. And in this desperate situation with the fairly large tumors as you see here, this is a lateral view, the upper tumor here and the lower tumor here. They are about equal size. Maybe this is a little larger. In this situation, I implanted electrodes in this one and this one. I made this one electropositive and this one electronegative because we had no time to lose. Next slide. And here you see the implanted electrodes, two here and two there. This is a lateral view of the implantation. Here is the draining tube in the pleura I talked about. And when I treated these, they got exactly the same amount of current, the same amount of voltage, the same time, of course, and they were of equal size in the same lung, the same origin. Next slide. To my surprise, I saw that the cathodic electronegative tumor started to decrease in size, something I had not expected while the anodic tumor started to increase in size. Next slide. Then, of course, I implanted new electrodes, one in this and then, and reversed the polarity. And made this one electronegative and this electropositive. These are the, this is the position of the new type of electrodes. Next slide. And then I found, now oh, this is reversed, that this tu tumor here started to decrease slightly, but this one rapidly uh, diminished in size. And here you can see it's almost completely disappeared. What happens up here? This is not entirely my fault because at this stage the patient showed signs of metas new metastasis in the spine. Open up the spine to release the pressure and in addition they also made kind of revision of the soft tissues and the, therefore you get a reaction in this area here. But these are partly soft tissue reactions behind the patient. But it's quite clear that this tumor continued to grow and this disappeared on treatment. That brings up the question, what is the difference now? And I'm not able to tell you why but it may be connected with the immune system of the body. The immune bodies are charged compounds and they should move in an electric field and maybe I had accumulated them to the cathode. They should be electropositively charged then. I don't know but that would be a reasonable explanation. Of course the next time maybe I had depleted 
the resources. So I didn't get the same effect the second time. This is just speculation from my side, but I have to be critical to myself, and there must be some explanation for this different behavior of the same type of tumor, the same size in the same lung, the same patient. You can see here how difficult, there are many, many question marks here, but I think I have been able to show you many cases where you can really get control of tumors <coughs> with electrochemical technique. Next slide. Now, we have not exhausted our resources yet. This is a dog, messenger of a dog, and I placed two electrodes, electronegative, electropositive electrode here, and current is flowing between the electrodes. If I now give intravenously Evans blue dye, which is electronegatively charged, you can see here a nice accumulation around the, uh, the, the electrode. This is an electrophoretic concentration of a remedy, which we also can use with chemotherapeutic agents. Instead of treating the whole patient, we can direct the agent to the place where we want it in smaller amounts because, because we can increase the concentration. And this is exactly what I am doing now. And in this way, it's possible now to attack much larger tumors than before. In order to do so, I have designed electrodes which are, can be infused here with a chemotherapeutic agent. I use, permanent, uh, use now adamycin. I determine the polarity, it's electropositively charged, and consequently when I infuse it into the electropositive electrode, it will be moved out actively in the field through the tumor area in high concentration. Also, if I use small amounts, total amounts. This is one way to do it. There's another way too. You can, for instance, make the tumor electrode electronegative and infuse the remedy intravenously as now, is now the standard procedure. And, con and <coughs> accumulate it around the anode in high concentration from outside. And of course it's possible to use both techniques. Start with infusion in the center, drive it out, and another time give it intravenous and suck it up from outside through the tumor area. In this way, prevent the creation of all the side effects of the patient. Next slide. This is something I would like to show to kidneys of a dog. Uh, this kidney has been made electronegative and this electropositive. You see here a widening of the vessels of the capsule. And in this case, I have driven adamycin to the anode. You see here the blue stain, which indicates a very intense accumulation of the remedy. Next slide. However, if you introduce a cathode here, you obtain something I call the field flow interference. And that appears as a ring around the electrode. And this explanation of this is the following. There are veins flowing in the direction of the electronegative electrode. And they carry some of the dye. But they encounter the repelling force of the electronegative field and stop it at a certain level, where you have an equilibrium between flow and the electronegative field. It means a, a tremendous high concentration in a ring around. And this can also be used therapeutically. Next slide. <clears throat> this is a patient who came to me with no hope of any cure because the cancer here, which is originated from the bronchus, grows up to the bronchus close to the carina. Uh, the type of tumor didn't allow any treatment with radiation 
and chemotherapy. In this case, I introduced one electrode into the aorta of the patient, another one in the center of the tumor. I made the aortic electrode electronegative and the positive was placed in the tumor and I infused here 50 milligrams of adiamycin into the tumor under application of 10 volts. The remedy was driven out through the tissue and the current, where did the current go? Well, it follows the vessels which form conductive cables, as I told you, from the aorta over the bronchial circulation to the mediastinum to the tumor, which is supplied exactly by the bronchial arteries. After this treatment, the patient's pain in the chest disappeared. The patient had had pain for three months, continuous pain, and had to take pills every day. One hour after treatment, the pain had disappeared, and already, or as long as one month after the treatment, the patient was without any pain. You see here there was a dissolution of the, of the tumor. There are some infiltrations left here behind this, the, the first rib. So I don't pr want to say that I have cured this patient, but I think I have given the patient a good palliation, better than we could do with the other available techniques. Next slide. This is a lateral view of the bulging tumor. This is after treatment, you see there, probably some tumor tissue left. Next slide. Uh, this is another tumor with a very difficult tumor type. To, this is metastasis from um, um, kidney tumor, uh, hypernephroma, and the lobectomy was made and uh, a connection with the lobectomy, probably there was some implantation and this grows. The patient could not be operated because of poor cardiopulmonary function, and therefore I treated him. You see here the immediate uh, treatment effect with infiltration in the area where I disperse the adamycin. Next slide. <coughs> well, I think I can get uh, lights, please, now. I cannot say that I know exactly how to optimize this technique, but who could, could do that after a few years? If we think about radiotherapy, practice all over the world for 80 years, and still we are not capable to say how to optimize that technique. And this technique here is much more complex and gives many more possibilities to change the individual parameters. So it would be impossible for me to say that I have optimized the technique. I am also continuously chaining and trying, as you see here, to improve the possibilities by adding the possibilities of chemotherapy without producing side effects of the patients. And that means <clears throat> that I don't have any statistics to show because the material is changing all the time and the primary material is a selected material of non-operable or non-curable cases. So it's the worst material you can think of. That makes it very difficult to convince people and say, what is your cure rate? You see, <laughs> it's ridiculous to speak about it. We need to help each other and work for 80 years before we can say, tell, speak about cure rates this technique. But what I think I can have maybe shown to you is that it is possible, this is a way to work, it's possible to get control of tumors which otherwise are non-curable. And it doesn't exclude the use of other techniques. Thank you for listening.